We talk a lot on this show about how healing can lead to achieving your dreams. But what happens when you get your dream before you're healed? What happens when you get it quickly and at a young age before you know who you are? Then when you're deeper into your adulthood, still going down your path, it hits you. I don't want the dream this way. I want to have my own voice. I want to change my life. And when you realize that, how do you come back to the dream from a place of authenticity or find a new one? Today's guest is an incredibly successful billboard topping musician who had it all and found herself on the ground, having to rebuild from a place that was true. This conversation with her will help you to find your authentic voice and rebuild your life and journey. Welcome to Unleash Your Inner Creative with Lauren LaGrasso. I'm Lauren LaGrasso. I'm an award-winning podcast host, producer, singer-songwriter, public speaker, and multi-passionate creative. This show sits at the intersection of creativity, mental health, self-development, and spirituality, and it is meant to give you tools to love, trust, and know yourself enough to claim your right to creativity and pursue whatever it is that's on your heart. Today's guest is Chrisette Michelle. She's a Grammy award-winning recording artist, newly crowned TEDx speaker, and she just launched her brand new podcast, Come Back Sis. She has weathered the journey of a 15-year career topping the Billboard pop and R&B charts, collaborating with artists from Jay-Z to John Legend and touring the world. She's experienced cancel culture firsthand, love, marriage, and divorce, and the stigmas that come with adult ADHD and bipolar type 2, all while being in the public eye. I first met Chrisette when her and I were speakers at LaToya Cooper's Think Pink Power Conference last September. That's when I learned about her spiritual journey and just what an amazing teacher she is. And I knew I wanted to have her on the podcast to share her story. You'll hear Chrisette and I reference a cancellation she experienced on the podcast. This is referring to a dark night of the soul she went through after she was canceled following a performance at Donald Trump's inaugural ball. She has since talked about this and this is what her TEDx speech is on. Before you make any judgments, I 100% recommend you go over there and watch that. But she was sharing how when she did it, she was trying to bring hope to a deeply divided and in pain country that she herself did not vote for Trump. And she was trying to find a way that we could all come together. She since realized that was not the way. And her fans very much and very vocally let her know that they thought she made a mistake. So she sat with that pain for literal years did all kinds of healing work, all kinds of self-development work, and has emerged with a deep understanding, humility, and love for people. She says throughout that whole thing that lovers don't fight hate with hate. They just approach everything with love. And through this journey, she has found her true voice and her true dream. From today's chat, you'll learn how to rebuild yourself after going through a dark night of the soul, how to listen to your body's signals, the difference between a spirit and a soul, how to find safety in your voice, artistry, and creativity, the power of setting boundaries, the importance of self-love, and much more. Okay, now here she is, Chrisette Michelle. Thank you for being on Unleash. Thank you. You're welcome. And I just want to take you back to how I was introduced to you as a human. Like I was aware of your work before, but we both spoke on a paddle for LaToya Cooper for the Think Pink Persona panel. And I knew you were such a successful musician and I fully expected you to come on there and be like, okay, here's 10 tips you need to know to make it in the music industry. And you came on there and you blew me away. Mm. You took us inside of a therapy session, you spoke from the heart, and you made every single person in that Zoom room feel seen, feel like they mattered, and you had such presence. And I know that was hard-earned presence. It is hard-earned presence. And you've gone on this spiritual awakening in the past seven years. I mean, you've already been spiritually awoken, but kind of self-awakening. And I just love it. I listened to your episode. I think it was called, what was it? Healed isn't. Oh, healed ain't a flex. Yeah, healed ain't a flex. (laughs) (laughs) So in this episode you did, you really took us on the full trajectory of how that happened and how that affected your creativity. And you had to get there through a lot of trauma. So I wonder if you can take me from that point of when you just self-describe it as getting knocked down to now standing in your truth and creating this renaissance of creativity, of self-love and self-knowledge. Take me through 
some of that trajectory. I love what you said. There's a juxtaposition between spiritual awakening and self-awakening. Girlfriend, so many of us have been spiritually awakened. Yeah. We've been spiritually awakened since our mama taught us how to pray, since our cousin took us to our first yoga class. Spiritual awakening is something that happens in this walk of life. Wherever you go, you're going to be awakened in your spirit by all of the things that are going on in the air around you. But when you can connect yourself to what the spirit is asking of you, that's a whole nother level. And sometimes the self is so weak and sometimes the self is so fearful and so afraid that life has to punch it in the face and say, self, listen, I'm going to knock you out, right? I'm going to knock you out and I'm going to teach you that you heal. I'm going to teach you that after you heal, you function. And I'm going to teach you that after you function, you have purpose. Girl, I was spiritually awoke since I was a kid. Nine, right? Yeah. Yes. And now I was awake. But I was so afraid in my physical body. So I didn't get brave in my body until I got knocked down in my body. You talked on the pod about how, you know, it really was like a seven year healing process from getting knocked down when you got canceled to coming out again and feeling I know who I am. I can use my voice. What did you do? So you initially got knocked down. Tell me about that process of getting back up. So there's this physical uh, process of healing that doesn't look exactly like the spiritual process. And that physical process is about finding self-disciplines that work to create self-mastery, right? And so those disciplines might look like waking up before the sun comes up to sit in your physical, actual body and meditate and to hear your dreams and to write them down and to take a look at them with your physical eyes and see what they say and do the same thing the next morning and see what similarities you find and begin to learn how to interpret your dreams and see what they're asking you to become for the future. That physical, actual uh, lifestyle discipline may look like next, going into the kitchen and cooking or, or creating a meal that goes through your body and encourages healthy digestion so that you're constantly being renewed literally, physically, not spiritually or on the inside and eliminating what you no longer need, toxins. As you begin to regenerate your physical body through prayer and meditation, physical prayer and physical meditation, physical exercises that soften the body and remove the traumas of the past from your physical body, your spirit has a place to take a seat in. Mm. My spirit didn't have any place to sit down. My body was, it was traumatized from childhood, through the music business, through public humiliation. Uh, So my body needed to de-traumatize itself. And it came through physical movement, came through a gym discipline, going to the gym daily, not necessarily to just lose weight, but to practice actual movement so that I could learn that I could command my hands. I could command my feet. I can trust myself to tell myself what to do and I will do it. And so it became this relation thing where I had to become aware of my own voice, speaking to my own ears and trusting my own body to do what my voice said. So that's what healing my body looked like. And I'll tell you this, whoever got in the way of that physical healing had to get out of the way. And that was the hardest part of the healing was, oh, you you can't support me eating healthy. Oh, you can't support me going to the gym daily. Oh, you can't support that I need three therapists right now, one for trauma, one for cognitive behavioral therapy, and one psychiatrist. You can't support the physical things that I have to do to master this next step in my life. Excuse me for a minute. And so it was a literal physical discipline that became the healing process. It was more than just spiritual. It was giving my spirit a place to sit. I've never heard anybody say that before, giving my spirit a place to sit. So brilliant. I feel like in the past, my younger self used to be like, well, I'm not a body. I'm a soul. I'm just a soul. But what is it about actually acknowledging that, no, in fact, we do have a body. We are living in a body. We need to give our soul a place to sit that actually brings you closer to God. Yeah. So the difference between the spirit and the soul is the spirit is this God thing that he knew all about it before you even had a body. The soul thing, which is my favorite part, right? Because the ego lives there, the self lives there, my ideas live there, my color lives there. That's the part that I take my spirit, I interpret it, 
and my soul tells my body how to move around on this planet to connect with people. My soul is my obedience to my spirit in this earth realm. So my soul is the outfit that I wear. My soul is the way that I wear my hair. It's the melody that I decide to put in the song. It's not necessarily physical, but people can feel it. Um, and it comes from me, Chrisette, the person. It does not necessarily come from my spirit, which is more so my guide for what my purpose is. You, you see what I'm saying, the difference? I don't know if I know the difference between a spirit and a soul. So like, how do you find your spirit then? Your spirit was here already. It was already its own thing. It was already the God idea. It's the God idea of what's needed for you for destiny. This is what's needed from you for destiny. That comes whether you like it or not. If your destiny is to, I'm just making this up, birth three children, raise them and they become doctors, you're not really getting a choice in the matter. But your soul is maybe how you dress your kids. Your soul is what you make your kids for breakfast. Your soul is how you cut their peanut butter and jelly sandwich in half. It's how you color the things that you've been asked to do here on the planet. I like that. I Again, you're just, you're completely original. You're saying things I've never heard anybody else say. Spirit, soul, and body. People say mind, body, and soul. Spirit, soul, and body. Kind of the same thing, right? Your spirit and your mind are best friends. Your soul is how you color the planet. And then your body, that's this physical thing here. So how did you discover that you needed to start working out the trauma in your body? Like, were you doing somatic healing? What gave you that wisdom? Yeah, my mom is a behavioral scientist. And every movement that somebody makes, she can see where it comes from in their past. It's like, mom, really? The way they hold their pancakes, like, mom, it's enough. And so I was hearing that kind of language around me all the time. Even when you get a dog from a dog farm and he's hiding underneath a chair because there was trauma at the dog farm, you know, like we hold that same type of trauma in our body. So I knew that my desires were to do what my spirit needed me to do. I knew that in my mind. I knew that in my soul. But my body was so traumatized that I would just be curled up in a hole. So I knew that something needed to change in my body. I innately knew that because my body wasn't moving. A doctor would call that anxiety. A doctor would call that stress. That becomes inflammation in the body. You can become sick from that type of uh, just fear that's built up inside of the body. So I knew that I was traumatized. And something told me I just needed to move. I just needed to tell my body to move. And what started changing for you once you did physically start releasing that trauma? What did you notice inside of you emotionally changing? Yeah, there's that book, The Body Keeps the Score, that I always like recommend. It's it's a very intense book, but it helps to put language to all of this. But I went to go get my yoga teacher certification in New York City, which is the loudest place, but there's this big, beautiful concrete basement with blue lights where I got to get my certification. And it's quiet in the yoga studio and you're there for eight hours a day for this, you know, however long this intensive is for six days a week. And we would move our bodies in this silence. We were learning our sequences. And when you don't have words to express the movement and you're just moving, you just begin to feel yourself commanding your body and you begin to feel what parts of your body are tight. And in yoga, you're taught to really listen and feel what's tight today. Was it tight yesterday? Do you have grace for that tightness there? And I began to see different parts of my body be tighter or looser depending on what I hadn't released. There were moments in yoga where I might be doing, oh, like back bends. Those make you feel like you're going to die. Why is that? Because our womb space where most female trauma happens is shooting up to the sky and being completely exposed to an entire room of people. So anything, any ex-boyfriend, any ex-girlfriend, any experience that you have that was held in that womb area, and you're opening it up and saying, hey, everybody, I'm going to be backwards now and shoot my belly up to the sky, that's asking a lot of yourself. That part of yourself is scared and broken and hurting. Or any heart opening exercises, if your heart's been broken, even for some people, just standing up tall and standing in standing uh, position and the rest of their body just being relaxed and their head having to be held high is traumatic for some people. 
So for me, it was back bends. I would just be like, oh, they can see my soul. And in yoga, you know, it can be a little strange. It's okay to cry. That would be the moment where I'd cry. I know this is like a sidestep, but I feel like I want to talk to you about this yoga stuff because there's Mm -hmm. some postures in yoga that I'm like, why is that hard? That doesn't seem like it should be hard. Like, okay, I don't even know what this is called, but you know, the one where you go over on one leg and then your other leg is like sprawled out wide. So you're squatting Mm -hmm. the squatting one. Oh, a warrior one. I guess I'll just get up on the couch and show you what I'm talking about, Mm -hmm. but it's like, you're squatting like this. Oh, yes, 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 yes. You know when the other leg is wide down? Mm-hmm. Yeah. For some reason, that pose is another one that makes me feel like I don't know how I will possibly survive this. And it's not a pain thing. Yeah. It's an emotional thing. What is that? <laughs> yeah. It looks like you have a fear of becoming off balance, right? Because you only get to use one leg is doing one thing. The other leg is doing a completely different thing. And you're asking your mind to split in half and do two different things. I feel like that sometimes when I play the piano, I've cried practicing because it's like, how can this hand be in this posture and this hand be like, it sounds like you just have a fear of becoming off balance. Maybe. Does that resonate at all? Have you ever felt like I need to stay balanced? Yeah. Like every day. (laughs) I'm also a musician and play guitar, and that really resonates. I remember how frustrating it was trying to figure out how will I possibly play with the right hand and then switch the chord. And you're really good. You're really good. And all your friends watch, and they're like, wow, you're so good at yoga poses, or you're so good at the guitar, and they have no idea how long it took to feel safe and to trust yourself with two things at once. So I love this word you feel that you use safe, because another thing I loved when you were talking about this seven year period of healing was that you learned for the first time to create for yourself. Mm -hmm. What was it like to find safety in your own voice, artistry and creativity? Man, that's such a good question. So it looked like being in my prayer closet and singing songs to God and literally closing the door and praying that nobody could hear me. I had a a yoga and a voice studio and the voice studio was separate from the yoga studio. I would close the door and just pull out the piano and just play and sing and write. And I would say, God, please don't ask me to sing this to the world. Like, can this just be our songs for us? And I would feel so relaxed and so relieved and so at ease. It was the first time music became my therapy. It's still scary to think that one day I may share some of that music with the world. Most of it, I probably won't. It is very close to me and dear to my heart, but it made me question a lot of my more spiritual singing friends who are like maybe in the Christian space or just the inspirational space even, and be like, how do you sell that? Like, don't you feel like you're selling your soul when you sell that music? It's something that I have to reconcile with because I don't get it. It doesn't make sense to me. I totally hear you on that. At the same time as you're talking, I'm like, God, I feel like I need to listen to those songs. Isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we're we're putting a tour together and um, I just got out of the studio. We did all this fun stuff with just songs from my heart and poetry. The big plan is to release it, but release it on tour with people who purchase tickets because they like me or they want to see me. And so I feel a little bit more safe. So that's the big exciting news that's going to come out at the end of the spring. That is so exciting. I feel like, you know, to your point, when you're asking, like, how do they sell that? Because you wrote this from the point of view of I'm never selling this. And in fact, I'm literally praying to God that I don't. Yeah. (laughs) That's exactly why we need to hear it. And it's a service you're doing when it's released from that point of view. When you're truly creating something from pure love from pure love and inspiration, that is a service. And I think an energy exchange actually is like appropriate for that. Mm. If you look at it that way. I hope so. Cause the people I told you I asked are my favorite artists. Yeah. Favorite artist. I'm their biggest fan. They only create from there. Yeah. I think something really magical is going to happen when you put those songs into the world. Thank you. I don't know. I want to ask you something. And if this is totally off base, you can tell me. But when you were speaking at LaToya's, you know, seminar, and when I heard you do your TED talk, do you feel like 
musician is too small a term for you? Oh my God, yeah. It's just the channel. I'm here for humans. If I was tap dancing, if I was a plant, if I was a gardener, if I was a nail tech, if I made styrofoam, like I just am here for people. That's the point. I try and keep some stuff for myself, but yeah, musician is like, okay, so I'll be here for people through music until I'm here for people as a, I don't know, toad. I don't, whatever my next assignment is, but yeah, I don't, I don't even get it when we have to like call ourselves something. I don't try to make believe it makes sense to me. It doesn't. Yeah. I agree with that. Doesn't like when, when you go to a party and someone's like, well, tell me about yourself and they want you to tell you what you do. I'm like, wait, but that wasn't the question you asked. Do you actually want to know yeah. who I am or do you want to know what I do? Because those are two different questions. So when people ask you that these days, how are you answering them? Yeah. So my favorite place for these conversations is on the front of the plane, first class flights, because everybody has this incredible title. <laughs> and so it's where I get to test out my confidence by saying, oh, I'm a soul singer. <laughs> And then the next person I might say, oh, I'm a yoga instructor. And I will have all the credentials and all the professional accolades, so to speak, to be those things. I have yoga insurance. At the time I had a yoga studio, but am I brave enough to say it? So yeah, it's always a, a hilarious joke. And sometimes I'm excited when I'm sitting next to somebody else who does 50 things. And we laugh hysterical because we're like, don't you hate when people ask you what you do? And it's like, a lot of us feel that way. Yeah. It's actually more natural to be many different things, but people put themselves in boxes. So then they want to box you too. Yeah. Airplanes are the most intimidating place to start conversations. Because if you don't get that first sentence right, you're stuck with that person for six hours. You know what I mean? Yeah. So what am I going to say that I do <laughs> to this person is the beginning of either the beginning or the end. Yeah. How do you, when you wake up some days, do you know how the creativity is going to flow? Like, do you have an instant hit or is it just, it comes how it comes? Maybe you're going to do a yoga pose. Maybe you're going to write a song. Maybe you're writing a speech. Like, how is it flowing these days? Can I tell you the truth? Yeah. Hey, creative. As you know, consistently creating new content isn't easy and requires a lot of focus and energy. It can be hard to balance, but thankfully, I found a new product that can help you get just the right amount of energy. It's Magic Mind. I still love my coffee, don't get me wrong, but instead of reaching for a second and third or even a fourth cup of coffee to keep my energy levels up in the afternoon, now I just take this little shot and it helps me get through the afternoon lull and really make the rest of my day count. I like it for a couple of reasons. I really do feel more alert after I take it. For instance, I took it right before I did an interview and didn't have the coffee jitters or a crash from it. It just gave me sustained great energy and made my brain feel really clear. I also like it because when I take it, I feel less stress and anxiety because it contains a compound called L-theanine that naturally reduces your body's stress levels. My favorite ingredient in there is probably ashwagandha, which is an adaptogen that reduces stress and anxiety because, again, we're always trying to get those lower in 2024. I totally would encourage you to try it if you're looking to cut back on coffee, you just want some more energy in the afternoon, or you're looking for something that energizes you without stressing you out. It's really great. And great news, the Magic Mind team created an amazing offer for me to share with you. You can get up to 56% off your first subscription in the next 10 days and 20% off your one-time purchase with my code INNERCREATIVE20. That's INNERCREATIVE20. You can get it at magicmind.com slash innercreative and redeem the discount code INNERCREATIVE20. But hurry up because the 56% off discount only lasts 10 days from our episode airing date. So check it out and let me know how you like it. It flows best when I am the most hydrated and my food is organic, where I'm the most electric, where I'm exposed to the sun, where I'm in tune with the elements, where I'm getting enough dirt and soil underneath my feet or in my hands through my house plants. It comes best when I wake up before the sun comes up so I can listen to my dreams and let them be guidance. And it comes best when I prepare to go to bed before I go to sleep by turning off the lights, by asking 
for a dream by asking for answers before I go to bed. That's how my creativity flows best. It flows best when I keep negativity and fear out of conversation. That's the hardest part is, unfortunately, we can't talk about this because it's projecting fear onto my life. So that's when it flows best is is when I'm living a very non-toxic life. You know, speaking of that, because you talked earlier about setting boundaries when you were in the state of healing and getting back up. Was that something that was intuitive to you before that time? And if not, how did you build up to being a boundaries queen? So hard. So there was this particular type of therapy that we did with one therapist and she had different seats and she would say, let this seat be you from the ages of five to 12. Let this one be 13 to 18, uh, 18 to 21, and then 21 to however old you are now. And when you sit in each one of those chairs, I'm going to ask you a question and you can answer from any one of those chairs. And what I learned was that as I grew older, I created different boundaries based on different traumas that I had experienced. Holding on to boundaries and releasing boundaries is based on how much you trust yourself now and knowing what you need for yourself. When I got married, I was under the impression that I didn't need any boundaries because you become one. And so it was outstandingly difficult to create boundaries in a marriage. And that's when I began that kind of therapy. I learned that even in relationship with other people, it's still my responsibility to protect myself. Nobody's going to rescue me. Nobody's going to protect me for me. Nobody knows what happened when I was seven years old. They don't know how it felt in my body and in my mind. I have to protect that seven-year-old girl even now today. I have to let her know it's okay to walk in that room. It's okay to go to the grocery store, even though when you were seven, you got yelled at by the cashier. Boundaries for me became about not asking other people to protect me all the time. That's what I became as an artist. That's what I became as a wife. Where's my security? Where's my mom? Where's my husband? Where's my team? Creating boundaries as Chrisette, the person, I was really difficult for me. Protecting myself has been a really scary journey. Chrisette, I relate so much. That's been like the biggest takeaway of this past year is that I will never hesitate to stand up for someone else. I literally in high school would throw myself in between people fighting and say stop and they would, but I couldn't do it for myself. It took a similar kind of therapy where I was like, why is that little version of me like sitting alone in the corner crying when I could protect her? How have you worked on being the wise adult for that younger version of you, especially when you feel triggered? Because like those moments will come up and you're going to want to fall into an old behavior or way of being and just say, oh, yeah, it's fine. It's fine. That's that's good. And do what you used to do. How do you make sure you're care taking care of your younger self and your current self? Yeah, so publicly, and I like to answer that from how that happened for me in front of people, was, no, I'm not going to put out another song right now. This song's for me. And I kept testing myself saying that to see if I really meant it. And I did. And I kept meaning it for like a year, then for two years. And I was like, oh, my God, I can take as long as I want to record this song. You don't understand. It was so exciting for me because I had never done that before. I always delivered an album whenever I was asked to deliver an album, a single, a video, a photo shoot, whenever I was asked. And I would allow people to criticize it and kill my soul, break my soul. That's what Beyonce is talking about. And this time I said, I'm not putting anything out. And people would say, uh, and it's why I named my podcast Come Back Sis. People say, come back, Chris, come back, Chris. And I'd be like, oh, I'm back. I just don't have any music out. I'm touring. I'm just not touring with an album. Because I had to let myself know that I created my art and I'm not obligated to be anyone's therapy. I'm not obligated. As much as I love to be, as much as I want to be, I want to be this wise old sage with a black cat. That's like my jam since I was like, 10. But yeah, so my boundaries in public began with my voice. They began with me saying, I'm not ready to put out a new song. And it's been so empowering. Now that I am ready, I'm not concerned about what people think. Does that make sense? I'll be okay if you don't like the song. Yeah. Well, you said that too in the podcast. I thought it was so interesting. You said like when you're broken, 
criticism, you can't metabolize it. It's just untenable. But now that you've worked through the, all these things and finally healed, you can take that and make, and you can know it's not actually about you most of the time. It used to cripple me. I would eat and eat and eat and numb and numb and numb. I developed a binge eating disorder where I literally had to go and see a doctor because anytime anybody said I did something wrong or my hair wasn't nice or I was ugly or I was fat or I couldn't sing or, I mean, it broke my soul. My spirit would know. God's got you, but my soul's like, I can't color here. Mm. I can't play with these people. They hate me. I don't feel like that anymore. Is it because you finally feel safe inside of yourself? So you're not looking for safety from all these other people. Mm -hmm. That's exactly it. I can stand up for myself now. I know something that you're super passionate about right now is empowering Black therapists and psychiatrists and you've been so open about your mental health journey. It's been so powerful to witness. Could you talk a little bit about that? Because I know this is like your ministry right now. Yeah, mental health is my jam. And it's because I know what it's like to be bipolar. Uh, and I know what it, it's like to be neurospicy with ADHD as an adult, uh, which is my favorite new fun word, neurospicy. But yeah, what, I, what I've learned is that people want to feel understood culturally and people want to feel understood like mentally. And when your psychiatrist or your psychologist doesn't understand your culture, then a lot of times you'll fear that, but they won't understand you. And so I recently did a talk with one of my Zeta sisters in North Carolina, and it was a uh, Black mental health conference. And the entire audience was uh, Black mental health doctors, psychologists, psychiatrists, social workers, et cetera. And I explained to them, listen, we love you, we need you, and you're the treatment program. You are what gets us from point A to point B to point C. Without your information, without your education to us as your clients, as the people who you're treating, we won't understand what's going on in our mind. And when I tell you, there were so many testimonials from different psychologists saying, I hadn't felt like anybody could see me. I wanted them to know that just because society is saying, quote unquote, black people don't go to therapy doesn't mean that they won't go to therapy. It just means that they need to feel safe and feel like they'll be understood culturally in therapy. My hope is that I can be an encouragement to black therapists and black counselors and psychiatrists and psychologists to know we need you. We need more of you. I know that it's difficult with insurance and things like that and, and the disparities in the insurance space. Uh, but you are seen, you are felt, you are needed, you are heard, and you appreciate it. So powerful. And I love that you're calling out the myth that Black people don't want to do therapy or can't do therapy or won't do it. I can really understand why a Black person would want to go to a Black therapist so that they understand the intricacies of being a Black person in this country. Or mm -hmm. I mean, you've spoken so openly about therapy. I know something that a lot of people feel when they're going out to look for a therapist is like, where do I even start? If there's someone listening right now, specifically like a black person who wants to find a therapist who understands their point of view, how would you recommend they start the search? Yeah. So if you have insurance and you get to go into your um, insurance portal and type in all the things that you want, go in that left column and get really specific and granular about what you want. Check all the boxes that say who and what you are, because all those boxes are actually there. The second part is this, and this is the hard part. You may have to see one therapist one week and then go and see another therapist the second week until you find somebody that you feel safe sitting with. And that's the part that I find the hardest. I, I have to move from city to city sometimes for the business. And if I'm in, I'm just making this up, Chicago for six months, I might have to see three therapists in Chicago before I find somebody I really want to sit with. So that part takes some time sifting through people, sitting with people and finding who understands you culturally. I've sat with therapists. I walk in and say, hi, my name's Chris Chrisette Michelle. Uh, this is what I do for a living. And this is what happened to me. Let's just make this up in 2017. And this is the newspapers that I was in. That's a lot for a therapist to take on. And we've all got some 
interesting stories. I won't say crazy, but we've all got some interesting stories. I've sat in front of therapists and they've cried. And I said, you know what? As much as I appreciate your empathy, I need someone stronger than me (laughs) or who can help me get through this. So your story may not feel safe in front of every single person you sit down in front of. Take some time to find the person who feels safe. Yeah. And don't feel like you owe them something. Like if you paid them, you you're good. Like your hands are clean. I've gone to therapists for one or two sessions many times. It's like dating. You know, if the vibes are off, you don't want to be sitting there pouring out your heart to this person because you're not going to get what you need in return. Yeah. Can I say this one thing about psychiatric diagnosis? Yes, please. There's so much fear around it. May I tell you how quickly in the neurology space and in the psychiatry space, those people diagnose you in under five minutes. It is not six hours of looking at somebody and feeling awkward. People can put little electromagnetic things all over your head and find out that you're ADHD in minutes. So I think a lot of people are petrified of being diagnosed with anything. Being diagnosed is the easy part. It's the therapy that comes after and the treatment program and the life of discipline that's up to you to master. Don't be afraid of diagnosis. What for you was the freedom in getting your diagnoses? I wanted to feel better. Because when I tell you I was standing upside down on my head in that yoga studio every single day, (laughs) and I was like, everybody else is getting up, you know, they do a lion's rack, (sighs) everybody's breath, and I'm just like, (sighs) (laughs) like, I want to feel better. And with ADHD, like, I want to be able to get through a, you know, a full day of business without feeling all over the place. Like, and I remember my, my neurologist said to me one day, I love her so much. She goes, Chrisette, don't you just want to feel better? (laughs) And I was like, yes. And um, that was the day that I had got diagnosed ADHD. Diagnoses for me, the freedom and the power is that now you know what's going on chemically in your body. And now you can become an expert on yourself. It's not necessarily about having to take medicine or having to go to therapy every single day for the rest of your life. It's more about what kind of lifestyle is going to be my new discipline so that I can be the best me possible in this physical body because my spirit's got work to do. What about someone who's listening right now who is resonating with what you're saying? They're like, yeah. I don't feel good. I want to feel better, but I'm terrified of what I'm going to find out. Like I'm terrified of what happens if I meet all of me. What would be your advice to them on how to baby step toward being open to it? Yeah. See what you can take breaks from in your life. So see what parts of your life you can quiet down because meeting yourself can be scary and you may need some time to get to know him or her, whoever they are. Um, You may need some privacy. You may need an extra hour in the middle of the day. So maybe it's about, you know what? I usually cook dinner all week. I'm going to do DoorDash for the next two weeks. And I'm going to give myself that hour to take a look at who I'm about to meet. Prepare yourself in advance to meet this new person because you're going to have to get to know them and you're going to have to go on some dates with yourself. So yeah, meeting yourself is really scary at first. And if you don't have time to meet yourself, you'll ignore yourself. You won't ever begin to trust yourself and yourself will shrink. Hey, creative. If you love the show and it has meant a lot to you, could you do me a favor? Rate and review on Apple. Give it a review on Spotify. Share it with a friend. These things all make a major difference in a podcaster's life and in growing their show. And I really want to build up this community of creatives who love, trust, and know themselves and love, trust, and deeply know others. So if you could do that and share the show with someone you care about, that would mean so much. All right, I love you. You said in your podcast, you think everybody needs to get knocked down, or I think you said knocked down. Mm -hmm. Why do you think sometimes we are required to have that knockdown moment to truly meet ourselves and know who we are? I don't know if I should have said that. Right? Like, that's really harsh. Because getting knocked down for me was really uncomfortable. I wouldn't wish that on anyone. My mom was recently diagnosed with a cancerous tumor, and I watched her go through chemotherapy, and now she's in radiation. I didn't want her to have to go through that. But everybody that I meet, 
who's spirit driven, who gets knocked down, finds some strength and some power in it. If your goal is to live this life out and be everything that the spirit is asking you to be, and getting knocked down only introduces you to the power of the Holy Spirit. If you're not interested in getting to know that power, that greatness that God can be in your weakness, getting knocked down is probably not a good idea. But I found out how powerful the God on the inside of me is when I got knocked down. I wouldn't have learned that, you know, skipping through the tulips. <laughs> and I love a tulip. Oh, gorgeous. We love a tulip. I have flown to Amsterdam to hang out in the Queen's Gardens specifically to purchase tulips for my mother. That's how much I love tulips. Wow. I didn't even know that there were a bunch of tulips there. I'm going to have to look it up after that. Oh, I'm a, I'm a tree hugger. You can, I, I'll find all the plants. You know what I like doing, Chris? I go on walks and I like wave at trees. I'm not kidding you. Why not? Because they're living and they're so beautiful and they've been here so much longer than us. They have so much to teach us. Yeah. Stop and say hello. Yeah. I totally feel you. Pay it a visit. And I just wanted to tell you too, on a personal note, I'm going to keep your mom in my prayers and I'm sending you and her tons of love. Thank you. I love this thing you said in your TED Talk. What I've learned about the heart of a lover, she doesn't become a hater just because she's hated. The heart of a lover serves wherever there's room to serve. Speak on this because this to me is what I call soul, S-O-U-L-C-I-A-L justice, social justice. And that's what I see you doing in the world. It's not just changing things and making a more inclusive world for people. It's doing it from a place that's actually loving. Tell me about that. Thank you. That means the world to me, what you just said. Thank you. Brings me to a friend of mine. Her name is Christina Fully Raw or Christina Bukaram. She's a, a vegan social justice hero of mine. And all she talks about is compassion. That word compassion is a lifestyle and it bites you in the ass often because people don't know what your spirit assignment is. They only see your soulfulness. So they see your beautiful hair and your beautiful nails and your beautiful jewelry and your, the way that you sing or the way that you play the guitar or your garden, all the things that you've made, but they have no idea what your spirit's assignment is. They don't know why you're here. They don't know your social reason for being here. And so you have to constantly lean into, I know that I just created a song that said who I am. I know that I just created a playground in an inner city community that says who I am, but there are always going to be people who don't know what my spirit is doing. They'll see the beauty that I create. They'll see the calm when they meet me, but they won't understand that my spirit has an assignment. And so the most difficult part about that social activation is that people may never see who you really are because it's a spirit space. And then I'd always connect it. Um, so just because my physical body or my physical being or my presence gets bullied, it doesn't mean that I get to act outside of compassion. I have to stay in passion. That's why I'm here. That's a tough one. That is a tough one. But guess what? If everyone was doing it, we would have a world of love and healed people. I pray for it. Yeah. That's why I do believe like self-love, self-compassion and self-trust are the key to everything. I see working on yourself as a social justice tool, because if we all did that, we wouldn't have people in power making decisions that hurt other people. Mm -hmm. And some of my favorite friends, and this is not a religious thing, but some of my favorite friends feel that way about trees. They feel that way about animals. They feel that way about bugs, the sea, the air. There are these people who compassion is their lifestyle. So much of me wants to be that. I am nowhere near where those girls are, but I admire that lifestyle. Wow. You come off that way to me because you really do inspire me to want to lead from the heart and to go deeper into my self-work for sure. Like seeing the way you relentlessly, but not in like a rough way, but like a gentle relentlessness toward evolution and self-love and then spreading that love to other people, to me, that that is your work. If I had to say, like, what does she do? I would say that. 
and everything else feeds through that filter. Amen. Thank you. That means so much to me. Yeah. We could talk about a million more things. Before we wrap, is there anything else you want to hit? Any other thing that's really on your heart that you want to share? Um, you can come hang out with me at chrisettemichellesworld.com or comebacksys.com for the podcast. I'm just having a really fun time making stuff. Uh, I'm really excited for the stuff I'm about to just make and share. We'll see what happens. There's going to be plants on stage in this next moment of my evolution, if you will. I'm really excited to play. It's been a minute. And I do want to ask you, because you've got this podcast out now, what does it feel like sharing something from the point of view because you just want to share it instead of, oh my gosh, I hope it does well. What has that been like? Tell me about that. I'm struggling with that. The sound of my voice, the shape of my forehead, like every, all of it. It's like, whoa, you're out there, kid. <laughs> I usually am posing for a photograph or standing sultrally behind a microphone and everyone knows what I'm going to sing next because they've already heard the song. The podcast, I'm constantly shocking people and myself. And I'm saying in the middle of things, guys, would you believe I just said that? As we get further into the season, there are tears, there are tissues, there are horror stories. It's a really fun experiment. I don't know how you do it. I mean, it's everything. I mean, this is a therapy tool in and of itself, as you're finding, because mm -hmm. I think it's one of the best tools to figure out who you really are. And you're going to be shocked, Chrisette, when you look back, because I've been doing this for five years now, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. And when you listen back to the audio of your original podcast, versus like one you do two, three, four, five years from now, you'll be shocked at how your voice changes in a good way because the veil completely lifts the longer you do this because you can't lie on, on air. People can hear it. People can hear it. Oh, yeah. People don't give people enough credit. People be knowing. Yeah. People who are tuned in and paying attention, they be knowing. Some people are angry and they only see what they want to see. But my favorite thing about people is that they actually see. It's really cool to me. Yeah. When they see and they interpret something in their way, it's like, oh my gosh, I didn't know I said that. Wait a minute. Let's talk about it. <laughs> That's a cool feeling. Has anybody quoted you yet? And you're like, wait, I said that? All the time. Even when we were filming, like my team would be like, did you hear what you just said? And I'm like, oh my God, did I just say that? It has been, like you said, it's been a learning tool. I don't know if I'm comfortable with it. Yeah, you'll have to keep checking in with yourself about that. I will say as somebody who has a podcast, has produced like hundreds of them over the course of my career, you have it. You've got it. You tell the truth. Like I was enthralled from the beginning to the end of that episode. Wow. And I knew exactly who you were because you knew exactly who you were in the episode and in real life. <laughs> wow. Thank you. I promise I sit behind the mic and say, is that okay? <laughs> it's not easy to monologue. <laughs> you monologued for 45 minutes. I'm like, I usually advise people to wait to do that till they've been podcasting for like six months. My team made me do it. They were like, you can do this, Chrisette. I'm like, no one's going to want to hear this crap. <laughs> it was good. It was really good. Thank you. Yeah, I can't wait to hear more. So I wonder... If you and the version of you from seven years ago were standing in the same room looking at each other, what would you say to her and why? Holy shit. If I saw her, I would dig a grave. Big dark circles around her eyes. She was scared. She couldn't walk into the grocery store. I mean, she was petrified. It wouldn't even be like, oh, you poor thing. Be like, what the F is this? <laughs> This Chris from Long Island, New York. You asking me that question gives me compassion for how people saw me. Because uh, people were really scared for me. Yeah. Like when people meet me now, they're like, I'm so sorry you had to go through that. They saw her. I didn't see her. I was her. And I couldn't look at myself. I say that all the time. If I had to look at myself, I would have gave up. I had to trust myself for who I needed to become. I couldn't look at the broken version of me. Mm-mm. Because I would have believed I was broken. That wouldn't have worked for me. Wow. So the final thing I want to know, if you and the version of you from seven years ago 
were standing in the same room looking at each other. What do you think she would say to you today and why? I want to be you. Totally. I want to be you. I love that question because the crazy thing is when everything went to SHITSs, the first thing I tried to do was dress like and look like and act like and practice like who I wanted to be in my soul. I practiced and I practiced because I knew what my soul wanted to do. I knew the sound she wanted to create. I knew the way she wanted to do her hair and her makeup. I knew who she was. And suddenly, after seven years of trial and error and falling and getting up, I'm finally her. I haven't presented her, so to speak. I haven't said to the world, excuse me, here she is, because I usually do that in album form. But I know that that girl would be like, I want to be you. I know she would. Thank you for asking that. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. (laughs) But I don't know if you're going to have to present her, Chrisette, because you are her. Mm -hmm. There's nothing to present. Like, there's no more performance. I see you now is just being you everywhere you go. Amen. I'm so happy you're here now. And it was well earned. And you're teaching a lot of us how to love and live authentically and create authentically. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening. And thanks to my guest, Chrisette Michelle. For more info on Chrisette, follow her at Chrisette Michelle. Get her music wherever good music is found. And follow her podcast Instagram at ComebackSys with CM, which can also be found wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks to Rachel Fulton for helping edit and associate produce this episode. Follow her at Rachel M. Fulton. Thanks to Liz Full for the show's theme music. Follow her at Liz Full. And again, thank you. If you like what you heard today, remember to rate, review, and follow the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Share the show with a friend and post about it on social media. Tag me at Lauren LaGrasso and at Unleash Your Inner Creative, and I will repost to share my gratitude. Also tag the guests at Chrisette Michelle so she can share as well. My wish for you this week is that you go through your own path to self-development and healing because on the other side of that is true authenticity and finding a dream that resonates with your own soul and spirit. I love you and I believe in you. Talk with you next week.